Hi everyone, this is Jason Burek of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first-time guest. I actually found him through Jay Taylor's website, and I think I've also seen him give speeches on the Mises Institute's YouTube channel. He's Dr. Murray Sabrin. He's a professor of finance in the Annis Field School of Business at Ramapo College of New Jersey. He has been a member of the faculty since 1985. He has a PhD in Economic Geography from Rutgers, MA in Social Studies Education from Lehman College, and a BA in History, Geography, and Social Studies Education from Hunter College. He's also been writing uh, Austrian School Economics articles for a long time, and I'm excited to have him on. Thank you for joining me, Murray. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jason. Now, Murray, I'd like to talk about your background first because it's unusual for someone, you know, especially someone who's teaching, to, to like the Austrian School of Economics. So uh, how, did, how did you find the Austrian School of Economics? How did you wake up to uh, kind of what was going on and see the world differently from most of uh, mainstream academia? Well, it's quite by accident. Uh, I think my first um, interest in economics, or I should say Austrian economics, came when I read um, – uh, Ayn Rand's book, um, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and there's some very interesting articles there, especially by Alan Greenspan about gold and economic freedom, pointing out how the Great Depression was caused by the Fed's monetary policy of the 1920s. And so I read that, became very interested in uh, Ayn Rand's ideas and free market economics. And then in 1971, flying home from Europe uh, uh, on Alitalia, we, uh, I was in coach, and uh, someone was reading the New York Times, and I, an article caught my eye. This is right after Nixon imposed wage price controls on August 15, 1971, and it said, the president's economic betrayal. I said, this looks interesting, so I borrowed the article, and it was by Murray Rothbard uh, talking about how economic fascism came to America with Nixon's wage price controls and delinking uh, the dollar from gold, the last linkage between the dollar and gold. And sort of I kept that in my mind, and then I decided in 1971, that year, to go to graduate school and get a Ph.D., which I started at Rutgers full-time in September of 1972. And uh, roaming through the stacks at the Rutgers Library in New Brunswick, I came across Rothbard's For a New Liberty and other uh, books of the Austrian school, and I eventually found my way to, up to the Foundation for Economic Education in February of 1974, and I had developed a, a doctoral um, a dissertation topic on inflation and how it spreads to the economy. As you know, uh, inflation was a hot topic in the early 70s. And so I immersed myself in Rothbard's books and Mises' books and the Hazlitt's books and finally met Murray Rothbard in uh, April of 1974 at Polytech Institute of uh, Brooklyn, where he was teaching. And he got me an invitation to the first Austrian economics conference that took place in Royal, uh, South Royalton, Vermont where I roomed with Joe Salerno from Rutgers, and we were both graduate students there. He was in the economics department. I was in the geography department, but I was interested in economic geography and how um, monetary policy and other uh, policies out of Washington affect not only the economy, but affect urban economies particularly. So that's what my dissertation topic was all about. And uh, since then, I was invited to a whole host of conferences, uh, through um, various uh, free market organizations like Institute of Humane Studies, the Center for Libertarian Studies. And it was sort of off to the races uh, since then of really immersing myself in monetary history, financial history, uh, capital theory, and just learning how the economy works from a free market perspective and how government intervention distorts the uh, economy and creates all these bubbles and these distortions, which gives us uh, recessions, depressions, panics. And so uh, it's through a long uh, route, I eventually um, uh, became uh, a professor at Ramapo College in 1985 and have been promoting uh, free market ideas uh, through lectures and inviting uh, guest speakers like Tom Woods and uh, Tom DiLorenzo and Bob Murphy, who were in my Fed documentary on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve uh, a couple of years ago, which is available on YouTube. Um, so... I've been really uh, uh, glad and uh, appreciative of uh, knowing all these people and uh, helping me develop my uh, understanding of economics and finance, which I can bring into the classroom, which makes the classroom a lot more interesting than just the textbook approach, which is essentially uh, a bland approach to economics and finance. And I like to explain to students that you have to understand the economy in the context of a, uh, an economy that goes through uh, sharp cycles and therefore 
they better know these cycles and uh, be able to identify them because they're going to be managing money or managing businesses. And so therefore they have to know uh, when to be defensive, so to speak, and when to um, uh, engage in sound uh, business uh, activity. Yeah, the, the Keynesians like to pretend that they've conquered the business cycle, but that's really cool that you were there from basically almost the genesis of the Ludwig von Mises Institute being created. I mean, that was around the time that, uh, like you said, Alan Greenspan was still a libertarian, I guess, before I guess he sold out to the bankers and the uh, academics before he got the big box to uh, to go and leave. But he wrote, um, I think, the gold, the, his essay on economics and liberty, and uh, gold is the only thing for economic freedom and to stop inflation. And then Warren Buffett's father, Howard Buffett, was also a libertarian. So it's it's really cool that that you were there from from the very beginning. Uh, my next question has to do with uh, problems with Keynesian economics. You know, you talked about the textbooks. Uh, one of the things I, I was an MBA student for a while, for about a year, and I did unfortunately have to take a number of these classes. Uh, what, what's your opinion with, with why these things still get taught in academia, you know, mathematical formulas, equations, bad theories, that they can conquer the business cycle? Well, the interesting thing about Keynesian economics, as you know, it's based upon uh, aggregates, that aggregates are the, the, the foundation of economic analysis. When the Austrians uh, take, I think, the correct approach, and it's not that I think, uh, I know they take the correct approach, which is looking at human behavior, human action. That's the title of Mises' uh, magnus opus, that you have to look at individual decision-making in the economy to understand how the economy is going to unfold, uh, that's, which leads you to the law of supply and demand, the law of one price, and all the uh, other major uh, foundations of modern economics, or sound economics, I should say. And so uh, the Keynesians have it all backwards because they, they believe that demand drives the economy, that consumption. Let's make it this way. Consumption drives the economy. When I came across a wonderful little uh, passage in uh, Murray Rothbard's um, essay, uh, The Case for 100% Gold Dollar, which I took and turned it into a little PowerPoint uh, slide that I have in my presentations, where in order to be a consumer, you first have to be a producer. In other words, you can't in a free market economy, you can't consume unless you first produce and get a paycheck or produce a product that's going to be sold in the marketplace for money. And then you can go around and take that money that you um, get by selling something, either a product that you've manufactured or a service that you've uh, provided for somebody, and then you can become a consumer. So I like to tell my students, I can't consume unless I first get a paycheck from Ramapo College by teaching you. So I have to be a, quote, producer in the service sector to, uh, to uh, make my consumption a reality. And that's why I think the Keynesians um, are all off base. They look at the economy in terms of these huge aggregates, and that's how they explain the economy in terms of gross domestic product. You have consumption, you have investment, and then you have government. And government is supposed to be the big driver of the economy because Keynesian economics is really depression uh, era economics. Because if you have a major collapse in the economy, the Keynesians say, well, you've got to pump up demand through fiscal stimulus, through monetary stimulus, and that's going to get the economy back to an even keel. When the uh, Austrians say, no, the reason that you have a depression is because you had a, a bubble that preceded the depression, and the depression is basically the, uh, the corrective period that is necessary to go through, as painful as it is, in order to make the economy uh, a lot stronger. And yeah, I think – yeah, I think the Great Depression of the 1920 and the 1970 stagflation should have killed Keynesian economics. I mean, it, it basically completely disproved them in real life. But yet, you know, here we are back to Keynesian economics where we have Paul Krugman and so many others on TV, whether it's Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke. And they're saying, you know, we need we need consumers to spend more. We need consumer confidence more. But you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it makes a lot of rational sense well, that if, if people don't have a salary, right, they I mean, they shouldn't be taking out all these credit cards and running up credit card debt if they can't pay it back. Well, the, the sad reality and, and Greece's example number one of this whole process is that um, governments have taken on so much debt. We, uh, our government has taken on so much debt that they can't repay because the unfunded liabilities, according to Professor Kotlikoff of Boston University, is $210 trillion, which means that uh, this has to be paid on the backs of young people, the people I've been teaching for the past 30 years, the, who are not so young anymore. They're in their 50s right now. But my students right now, the juniors and seniors I teach, over their lifetime, their taxes will be increasing, be increasing enormously to pay for all these uh, promises that the federal government made if it's going to keep them. If it's not going to keep them, that means that my generation, the baby boomers, and the following generation 
will be getting less benefits from the federal government. But we need to restructure the whole economy because the government is, is so involved in health care, education, um, and all the other things that they're housing, uh, energy, uh, you name it, they're involved in. And it's causing these great distortions by not allowing supply and demand to balance out in the economy. And therefore, the Keynesians say, well, it's OK to borrow because we owe it to ourselves. That's really what they're saying. And so Greece is in a mess because the bankers stupidly let money to Greece. The Greek, uh, the Greek government in expectation that the Greek government is going to pay these uh, uh, euros back with interest. And Greece, as we all know, is a very weak economy. They, have, they don't produce much. And so how is a, a, an economy that doesn't produce much going to pay back all its debt and interest charges over 10, 5, 10, 20, 30 year period? Yeah, I completely agree. And, and what really pisses me off the most about all of this, Murray, is that, um, is that uh, the Keynesians, the central planners, the politicians, the people in power, they're going to blame capitalism and free markets for something that you know central planning and government and central banks created in the first place, in my opinion. Well, this is, this is why I always talk about crony capitalism, and there's a great book by Hunter Lewis, Crony Capitalism, which I read uh, last uh, summer. And it's just a magnificent book that all your listeners – and um, uh, guests to your website should read. It's really one of the best books out there. Well, he names the people who are part and parcel of this network of uh, government and business and business and government, the revolving door between Wall Street and business and Washington. And they go there to get their special deals that benefit their uh, prior uh, uh, bosses or prior companies. And so we've got to We've got to do an enormous educational process, which is why the Mises Institute, LouRockwell.com, Tom Woods, and other websites are, are doing a great job in educating young people how they're getting shafted by the federal government and their uh, state and local governments as well. So I try to do in the classroom uh, as objectively as possible showing the relationship between bad policy or policy in general and how it impacts the business um, a community and business decision making. So again, uh, that's why it's important with the internet today to get the word out uh, to millions of people. And I just got approval for a letter I wrote about the Supreme Court decisions last week about gay marriage and um, and Obamacare, uh, showing how this is a violation of uh, the Constitution and individual rights. So that's going to probably be read by tens and tens of thousands of people in the state of New Jersey, including a lot of the uh, policymakers down in Trenton, because this is the largest newspaper in the state of New Jersey. So by writing letters in clear, coherent way that explain uh, how the Supreme Court is engaging in unconstitutional uh, decisions and how the federal government's unconstitutional policies are sort of rubber stamped by the Supreme Court, we let uh, hopefully we start getting the dialogue. But as you know, um, once you have a juggernaut life, this collectivist ideology that's out there, it's very tough to stop. Yeah, and the Supreme Court is the government's court. I mean, the federal court system is all the government's court. I did a semester in law school. So, I mean, if the government wants something done, they could put a lot of pressure on the on the judicial system to basically get what they want. And there's a lot of historical precedence of this. I mean, FDR tried to pack the Supreme Court with all the judges he wants. He tried to increase the amount of judges to get all the laws he wanted passed. So there, there's plenty of historical evidence that, that this it's well documented that politicians have tried to do this. And, um, you know, a lot of the the judges that are appointed are all political appointees for whatever reason, uh, whatever um, special interest or uh, or um, law that, that a specific group of political party wants to uh, pass. Uh, my, my next question for you, uh, since you ran for state senator of New Jersey, I want to ask you if you think the political system is uh, – the two-party political system is fixable or do you think it's broken? Yeah, I, I've had uh, an interesting experience in, in the political sphere. First, I was uh, recruited by the Libertarian Party to run for governor in 1997, and uh, I made political history in the state of New Jersey because I was the first third-party candidate to raise enough money that entitled me to matching funds. And once you get matching funds, I was automatically in the three debates with the two major party candidates, Governor Whitman and Senator slash Mayor McGreevy, who then went on to win uh, – the governorship in 19, um, I'm sorry, 2001. So I was there up close and personal with a sitting governor and uh, a Democratic gubernatorial candidate who eventually became a governor. And I must tell you, they, uh, I was very disappointed in the lack of intellectual um, discourse during the three debates that we had. 
And uh, it just confirmed what I think a lot of people uh, have said previously, that um, not the smartest people uh, get to be elected uh, governor or senator or even president. And so then in 1999, I uh, rejoined the Republican Party and sought the Republican nomination for the United States Senate. I didn't make it. There were uh, two uh, very well-established uh, candidates running. Uh, one of them won and nearly beat John Corzine in the general election in 2000. Then I ran again, ran again, again in 2008 as a Republican and did make it. And then again in 2014. But again, I was always true to the uh, philosophy of uh, limited government, of um, hard money, of deregulation, of privatization, of a non-interventionist foreign policy. So I didn't waver in my point of view, and I was getting 15 to 20 percent of the vote in the primary which is a not bad showing um, uh, in a Republican primary when in the last go around, uh, Governor uh, Christie apparently um, wanted to make sure I didn't get the nomination because he thought I would be with Rand Paul in 2016. And since he just announced today, uh, June 30th, that uh, he's running for president, he didn't want a, uh, a potential sitting Senate, U.S. senator in the state of New Jersey not supporting him. But I haven't endorsed anybody. I don't think I will endorse anybody uh, the way the uh, campaign is unfolding because no one is really embracing the limited government uh, ideology, philosophy on both domestic and foreign policy issues. Yeah, we, we saw Ron Paul. He, he didn't run, I believe, as a Libertarian Party candidate, at least the last couple of attempts. He ran on the Republican ticket, and that was because you know both parties have gerrymandered, and they basically tried to stack the deck at almost all levels of elections to where it's very difficult as a legitimate third-party candidate to even get on the ballot, You know how much money you have to raise, and – it, it just seems like both political parties, whether it's the Democrats or Republicans, you know, they all have a certain amount of special interest groups that they're beholden to. So they seem like basically puppets. You know, they've made a lot of campaign promises in order to get elected, to raise the money to get elected. And some of these large corporations, especially you know the financial industry, the banks, you know, they send almost equal donation amounts to both political parties. So it, it just seems like the political system, in my opinion, with Democrats and Republicans, is broken. But yet, you know, both political parties keep changing the rules to try to prevent any kind of drastic change to the political system. Well, the thing is, in 1971, when Nixon imposed wage price controls, at that time, I was fairly young at that time, I concluded that we essentially have one party in Washington called the Washington Party with two wings, the Democrats and Republicans. And if you look at policies of the federal government since 1971, and you were in hibernation for the past 44 years, and you looked at the, uh, the federal budget, you looked at monetary policy and all the other policies out of Washington, you couldn't tell who was uh, uh, which party controlled uh, the White House or which party controlled the uh, Congress because pres the second President Bush expanded Medicare. He gave us uh, another uh, undeclared war in, in the Mideast as the first uh, uh, President Bush did. And so uh, you have all these undeclared wars. You have um, a massive money printing by the Federal Reserve that um, very few people in Washington oppose. Uh, certainly uh, nobody on Wall Street opposes it uh, that I can see. They all love uh, cheap money because it allows them to uh, borrow money at, uh, at close to zero interest rates, which allows them to speculate and bid up asset prices. And so you have this almost Ponzi scheme, if you will, in our economy that's generated by the Federal Reserve because asset prices keep on going up. And the, and the key thing for them is to, and for everyone, is to get out at the top. Uh, and then it goes down and it goes up. And Warren Buffett, who, who's one of the major beneficiaries of cheap money, uh, I think he, he, he's done a very smart thing. He's built Berkshire Hathaway. He's never sold any of his shares. He knows the process is in place for the uh, dollar to be devalued through inflation, and he just holds on to his shares because eventually they keep on going up, in which they have wonderfully for 50 years uh, since 1965 when he became head of Berkshire Hathaway. So he's figured it out. Uh, I guess he learned enough from his father, Howard Buffett, the, uh, the congressman from Nebraska, who understood uh, money and the gold standard and all that and inflation. And Buffett, even though he's a, a anti-gold standard guy, he understands that his bread is buttered with the um, cheap monetary policy of the uh, Federal Reserve. Yeah, plus he's figured out because he spends a lot of money on lobbying for, with his Berkshire Hathaway companies here in Washington, D.C. He's figured out how to beat the tax man. So, you know, he doesn't pay himself a large salary. He pays himself a dividend, which is the lowest tax rate. So he, he gets crony capital deals. And with his lobbyists, he finds out 
he gets deals that other people don't. But yeah, exactly. I agree. The asset bubbles, I think, are something that Wall Street does not like talking about, that the Keynesians don't like talking about. When I listen on TV to Jenny Yellen speak or Paul Krugman or or even you know economists that are at large Wall Street firms that were trained in Keynesian economics that went to Ivy League schools, they don't count the asset prices going up as inflation, Murray. And that yeah. seems to me a clear evidence. You know, reading Murray Rothbard, uh, reading reading Mises, it seems to say that they thought the inflation in the most case would go into the capital markets first, and then yeah. it would start to trickle into the real economy. Yeah, this is this is the real trickle down economics that uh, um, uh, left wing politicians talk about, uh, don't talk about. They think that uh, pr uh, tax cuts are trickle down economics, but it's really the Federal Reserve's policies and government spending, federal government spending, that's trickle down economics. In other words, the money is going to trickle from Washington to the state capital to your uh, uh, municipality, and that money is going to be dispensed through various programs, and it's going to make life better. That's the, that's the theory. Of course, it doesn't work, but that's the ideology that's entrenched in our economy. But people are starting to wake up because of the Internet, because shows like this and uh, other shows that are out there that can reach literally hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people at virtually no cost. And that's the beauty of the Internet is that information is getting out there. And that's why um, you've got to have long term um, hope for the country and short term uh, concern because uh, people are really uh, frightened about what's happening to the country. And you see this all the time. And people I speak to around the state when I go talking about um, the upcoming financial crisis and a presentation I've put together, which I hope to go all over the state and maybe all over the country over the next six months to a year, because there's another financial crisis brewing. We all know because of all the incredible cheap money from the Federal Reserve, which is going to end very badly, as we all know, if you follow every central bank. Yeah, not just the Fed. Yeah, it's Japan, Europe, uh, China. They're all they're all pumping money. Th this is <laughs> unprecedented in world history, and we've never had this before. So. Uh, with all the asset prices reaching stra uh, uh, stratospheric um, uh, levels, uh, we may see something to rival 1929 to 32, 33, when the stock market went down 89 percent. I mean, that's the that's the possibility that's out there because of all the money inflating that's been going on. And there are people like Krugman and Stiglitz and other Nobel Prize winners who poo-poo this thing. They think everything is uh, pretty good because we have Obamacare. Uh, we have uh, a growing economy, but it's pretty tepid. I mean, this is one of the weakest recoveries of all time. Given And given all the monetary stimulus, you would think the economy would be booming at 5% a year, but it's not. They were, we're growing at maybe 2% a year at, at, at best. And so it shows you how weak the economy is, which, which is in line with what Professor Hayek said, that as time goes on, the, the central bank has to inflate more and more to get the same uh, stimulus effect. Like a heroin addict needs a greater and greater dosage to get a high with the uh, narcotics. And so we're seeing this, this is a perfect analogy that monetary stimulus is like the drugs that uh, an addict takes. And this is the economy that we have. We need more st stimulus to get the same um, uh, or higher responses to economic activity. Yeah, it's a law of diminishing returns. Absolutely. Um yeah, now I want to continue our discussion about inflation. You touched on it briefly. You also talked about inflation a lot in your documentary. You talked about how when you were growing up, when you moved to the United States because you weren't born here, you were an immigrant just like pretty much everyone else in the United States, But um, which, which is great because the United States is the – you know what was the land of freedom and economic opportunity, right? Although now uh, I'm not so sure. But um, in, in terms of the inflation, I mean the dollar has lost so much of its value – but when I go on the street, right, and I try to have a normal conversation with someone who isn't libertarian, who isn't an Austrian, who hasn't read any Austrian school economics, and I try to tell them, you know, they complain about why the prices of their food or the restaurant portions have shrunk the last couple of years, or their grocery bill has gone up, you know, or their rent has gone up, and they say, you know, it's the evil, greedy capitalists, the corporation just keep raising the money. And I try to explain them, no, you know, their costs are going up every couple of years because the, the value of the money keeps dropping. You know, it, they, they just don't get it. Uh, why, why, do you think we've been brainwashed then to where even though it's clear the dollar has fallen so much in value that people just don't understand it? Yeah, there's such an there's a, such a economic illiteracy in the country, and of course it's, it's, it's um, widespread in the Congress and in the Federal Reserve. And so that's why – we have to educate people, and that's why I put together this presentation. It's about 40 PowerPoint slides, which uh, incorporates financial history, monetary history, and uh, most recent history about the bubbles. And I show where the, how the next bubble is unfolding, 
and when it will probably occur and what people should be doing now in order to take advantage of uh, sort of a lull uh, before the storm. This is sort of the calm before the storm. And I was on WR Radio um, last Sunday night, uh, two days ago, the 28th. And I said, we should be doing right now, every American family should be doing what the Greeks are trying to do, which is get their money out of the bank, not all of it, but to have at least three to six months uh, living expenses at home. Um, and I just read uh, online before we uh, uh, got on the air that um, uh, safes are being sold in Greece at record numbers because people want to have a, a, a place of security to put their assets at home. And so we're going to we're probably going to see this in the United States uh, somewhere down the road as well. Um, in, in terms of, you know, the bust, when we get a bust like 2008, do you, do you think the, the central planners, the the, um, the Federal Reserve economists, are they going to be allowed to to go big uh, with the next quantitative easing program out of fear or scare people into that? You know, like they scared Congress in 2008 with the bailouts of TARP and so many other things. Are, are they going to be able if if the asset prices do crash? Uh, and say, you know, we have to print the money, we have to get the asset prices back up, or the money will stop at the ATMs and things like that? Well, this is the interesting thing, is that's why there is a, always a debate uh, within the Austrian school and within the free market hard money community in general. Are we going to have deflation or are we going to have uh, runaway inflation? I saw this debate in 1974 when we had the double-digit inflation, and people were talking about, no, we're going to have deflation, and Professor Rothbard wrote a great piece about this that uh, – Inflation is probably going to be the thing that is going to – a runaway inflation is probably going to be the end result of, uh, of this uh, fiat currency, fiat money experiment. And so with interest rates at zero or close to zero, the Fed can't lower interest rates anymore. I guess they can make them negative by, by penalizing you if you don't spend your money uh, and you keep it in the bank. Or the Fed is going to have to create so much money in order to, quote, stimulate the economy – then people will realize that uh, the money's not going to be worth much, and then people try to dishoard their uh, uh, savings and dishoard the, their income as they get it, don't save, and try to buy hard goods. And that's what happened in Germany in 1923, and that's what led to the spectacular runaway inflation, uh, hyperinflation of uh, uh, the Weimar Republic, which eventually led to the um, rise of Hitler. So we're being set up uh, again. I don't. I'm not cons a conspiracy theorist to say this is being done deliberately, but again, it's just bad ideas that's driving the Fed and policymakers to just keep their pedal to the metal uh, with regarding monetary policy. And the next downturn, as you point out, could lead to a, a huge, massive quantitative easing, which could propel the stock market to incredible levels, but also increase prices to a great extent because people will say, hey, why am I holding money when um, they're printing money like crazy? And that will be fairly obvious when they announce one day that they've created $10 billion in one day. Yeah, I think we've already started, in my opinion, the crack-up boom. I think we're just in the early stages, though. I think we're in the second inning. I think we're seeing the crack-up boom in asset prices first. The real economy, in my opinion, you know, when you look at prices, I don't believe the, the CPI, the unemployment, the jobs numbers, the GDP, I don't believe any of those because they're not accounting for the real inflation rate. But I think the real economy in the United States, at least, is going through worsening stagflation, in my opinion, because, you know, my, uh, there's a lot of people with higher unemployment or they're underemployed or their wages are stagnant and their bills keep, just keep going up and up at least a certain amount every year, maybe 6 percent, maybe 8 percent, depends on people's uh, spending habits. But um, I, I'm just – Based on my research, the people I've interviewed, the books I've read, I'm not sure the central planners, they're so committed to their Keynesian ideology, they hate deflation so much, I'm not sure they'll allow it for more than a certain amount of period of time. I have a tough – I don't know, but you, you've studied economic history as well. Have you found a period in modern history where um, – uh, Keynesian, modern Keynesians have allowed deflation to occur for a long period of time without massively intervening in the economy? Well, see, this is, this, is the, this is the paradigm of Keynesian economics. We had deflation in the 1930s, and we had depression. So for the Keynesians, deflation equals depression. But as I point out to my students, deflation, real deflation, in other words, natural deflation, is something that always occurs. I'm, I've been around long enough to see prices come down gradually as high tech makes things less expensive. When color TV first came to the marketplace in the 1950s, of course, we couldn't afford it. It was very expensive. But I said to myself as a youngster, 
you don't buy things when they're brand new. You wait till mass production takes place, and then the price comes down. That's exactly what happened with TVs, VCRs, were $1,500 in 1975 when they first came to the marketplace. And then eventually you can buy them for $100. Look what happened to uh, uh, the cost of computing. I'm sitting in front of an Apple computer today um, that uh, is a fraction of the real price of my first computer 30 years ago, which only had a 30 megabyte hard drive. Now I have, a, I think, a two t terabyte hard drive, and I paid less today three years ago for this computer than I did in 1984, 85 for a computer that had, what, one, one thousandth of the computing power of, of my computer today. Yeah, technology is one of the few markets, you know, the different industries, whether that's uh, digital cameras or flat screen TVs. I remember uh, when I was a teenager going into Costco and seeing like one of the first flat screen TVs, I think it was a plasma TV and it was only like 20 or 30 inches long and it was like five grand. I was like, oh my God, it looks great, but it's way too expensive. And now that thing, you know, 15, 20 years later, is like a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So, I mean, that, but that's a market, though, where the government hasn't drastically interfered like healthcare and some of the other yeah. markets that you briefly touched on. Yeah, well, you look at, you look at this, the components of the CPI and which two uh, components have increased the most in the last 20, 30 years, healthcare and education. Which is which is so uh, which are into uh, which the government intervenes in uh, most heavily, and so the the point is when the government intervenes, prices will go up and quality will tend to go down. Now we have great universities and colleges in this country, in spite of the government intervention of student loans and uh, and mandates and all that. Um, uh, education is still. Um, uh, has gone up the most. Healthcare has gone up uh, as well because of, of Medicare, Medicaid, and all the interventions. But in areas where uh, the free market has been allowed to um, uh, prosper, prices have come down or they stay the same. Even gasoline prices, in real terms, are cheaper today than they were after World War II. So it shows you how efficient the energy companies have been despite the massive inflation over the past 60 uh, years uh, from uh, the Federal Reserve. Housing, uh, look at the price of housing. Um, housing prices have skyrocketed. And in my documentary, I show the last house that we had we paid $90,000 for in 1982, and even with the upgrades that I made in 2007 at the peak of the market, we sold it for uh, more than $600,000. That's not because the house is scarce. It's because of all the funny money the Fed has printed up from 1982 to 2007. Yeah, I mean, beneficial deflation, that's what the free market produces. It normally, if, the, if it's left alone, the competition, the investment in new research and development, it, produ it produces higher quality goods and services at lower prices. And if the Keynesians got out of the way, I mean, look at the Great Depression in 1920. I mean, uh, there's so much debt in the economy now. I'm not sure at this point if we can have a Great Depression in 1920 anymore because of how much debt's in the system and how the money is now debt. But, you know, I would like to see what would happen if the market was allowed to correct and people were, were forced to do more with less. Well, the thing is, uh, Manhattan, as you know, and other cities, San Francisco, prices of rental apartments and condos and co-ops are just astronomical. I mean, my apartment here in uh, Fort Lee, New Jersey, right across the river from Manhattan, if I took this apartment and put it into Manhattan, it would probably sell for, I would say, two and a half to three million dollars. And... The price of our co-op in, in, in Fort Lee, New Jersey, is a lot less than that, well, well below uh, that price of, that it would be in Manhattan because uh, Manhattan is such a hot market. Uh, uh, Brooklyn has become a hot market. Now Queens is becoming a hot market. So, again, New York City is sort of the epicenter of all the funny money that the Federal Reserve creates because it flows through the uh, Wall Street community and the big banks in New York City. My, my final question for you has to do with the artificial boom that's still ongoing. Uh, are we gonna Are we gonna talk again? Uh, obviously, I want to have you back on in the next couple of months. Every couple of months, probably going forward for updates on the market from Austrian perspective. But are we gonna look back maybe ten years from now and say like, well, how have they kept things going? How have they still been able to print money and so many people are still asleep? And you know, Japan's printing money and China's printing money. Or are we getting uh, close to a tipping point? where um, you know, the, a lot of people on Main Street are going to wake up, the people who are managing money 
are starting to, well, wait a second, you know, these technology stocks are going up like crazy. Are we getting to a tipping point where more people are starting to wake up and actually question the central banks, politicians, central planners, and money itself? No, I think the dynamic that's unfolding here, Jason, is that uh, wages have been lagging, as you well know. It's been very hard to get pay raise. And you're starting to see the, the movement for a $15 minimum wage. You're starting to see um, uh, companies bidding up the price of labor because uh, some labor is uh, in short supply in some of these high-tech companies. They're, they're giving people bonuses to uh, work for them. So as wages and salaries start to increase, the Fed starts getting very nervous because they believe in cost push inflation. And so then they will start tightening up. And once they start tightening up, that's when the stock market will start heading south, just as what happened in 2007 when this, they started tightening up and we reached a peak in the stock market in the fall of 2007. So I expect that to happen uh, sometime in the not too distant future when wages and salaries start accelerating and um, the Fed gets very nervous and they start putting in uh, tighter money. If that happens, that's when the uh, real tipping point will occur and that's when the market will reach a peak. And so... Um, I just keep on monitoring this every month, and when I go back to uh, classes in September, I'll show students how they can monitor this, and we'll do this in the uh, three and a half months that I'm with them from September to mid-December. Then, of course, I do it again in the spring semester from uh, January to early May. So, again, um, by being on your show and be able to discuss this, and I can bring in uh, some of the data points that I look at, uh, we can see exactly how this thing is unfolding. But um, again, we've been in a business cycle environment since the beginning of the Republic. Prior to the Federal Reserve, as you well know, the banks, the private banks were printing money, and that gave us the uh, boom-bust cycle of the 19th century because of fractional reserve banking. So now we have the worst of both worlds. We have fractional reserve banking and central banking, and that's a toxic monetary mix for the economy. Yeah, but bank bank runs corrected those pretty quickly though, right? Yeah. So even though banks were there there was that was the era of free banking, uh they were the, it was corrected rather quickly. So people did lose their money, but there were bank runs and it was checked rather quickly. So it wasn't normally nationwide because, you know, people wanted uh they would put their money at banks, uh, a lot of them that had that weren't taking as much risk that would pay less interest, right? Well, what you had is uh these things were were fairly um uh, contained, but you still had some nationwide panics. You had the panic of 1819. 37, 57, uh, the Panic of 1873, the, the Depression. 1907. Uh, the, 1907, of course, you had the, uh, the uh, four-year depression of the 1890s. And so uh, you've had uh, the uh, bad policies because um, uh, the federal government uh, got involved in the monetary and banking system um, by suspending uh, specie uh, payment and all the other bad things that governments do to try to prop up the economy at the expense of the average person. Yeah, and the wage growth you're talking about, that would actually increase the velocity of money. And, you know, right now, all this money that's being printed is sitting there yep. idle. It's either on bank balance sheets or it's being used as collateral to speculate on asset prices. It's not really hitting the real economy as much as the F Federal Reserve thought. They thought there would be more lending and spending. But once that velocity of money picks up, I mean, that's the spark that ignites all the gasoline. Well, so that that would be, you know, demand pull inflation. That would that would create the massive amount of inflation potential. Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, I look at is uh, commercial industrial loans at the banks because that's the one of the transmission mechanisms for the new money to enter the economy as banks lend to um, uh, businesses to uh, to uh, continue the boom. Yeah, and the other thing you brought up about politicians and central planners and progressives, you know, trying to force the wages higher because they want someone who's a minimum wage worker to be able to afford a family on $15 an hour, which I don't think they still can, but they, they're saying that they should. You know, everyone's entitled to starting families, so they should be entitled to $15 an hour. It's going to cause unintended consequences. I actually did a podcast on this for a Welcome to Dystopia podcast about robots and automation. I mean, McDonald's and so many of these other stores – if these politicians are trying to force them to pay $15 an hour, they're just – because capital is so cheap right now, it's being artificially suppressed, and politicians trying to force higher wages, they're just going to switch to robots and touch screens at grocery stores and restaurants and retail uh, retail shops where people can check themselves out with the, with a touch screen instead then. Well, this is, a, this is a great example of be careful what you wish for. I mean companies are already stating that um, – Higher minimum wage will lead to uh, less uh, workers being hired. The other thing that Obama is recently pro is proposing uh, today, I heard, is he's proposing that uh, more workers get um, mandated overtime, and that's going to lead to less workers being hired or less workers uh, um, 
getting overtime. And so you, you're creating, uh, uh, again, distortions in the labor market and in the whole structure of uh, the economy. Well, I don't think uh, Obama understands free market uh, economics. I think Obama has never really worked in the private sector. I think he's mostly just a Marxist. I think uh, a lot of the stuff he repeats are about you know wealth distribution and you know re, uh, re, uh, transferring wealth to the middle class and the working poor and stuff like that. A lot of it's just rewarded what Marx said. Well, the, for, again, they they're basically uh, uh, magic wand economists. They think they can wave a magic wand from Washington and everyone's going to do what they think is going to give uh, uh, us a good economy. And that's not the way the world works. The world works because supply and demand of savings and investment of um, capital markets uh, unencumbered by uh, manipulating in, uh, interest rates by the Federal Reserve. You need freedom. That's the, the bottom line. You need economic freedom to have good outcomes or the best outcomes that, that possibly can be in an economy. Yeah, and that's letting you know individuals decide where to allocate their own money, their savings, and for investment or consumption and things like that. Well, absolutely. I mean, this is what uh, the founders understood when they created America. It was about economic freedom and, and individual rights and property rights and, and liberty. And you and now we're coming up to uh, the July Fourth celebration, and uh, for some people, July Fourth uh, died a long time ago because we no longer have the independence that the founders uh, thought that we would have as a nation. Yeah, we, we've turned into almost like a military, uh, a military totalitarian police state with, uh, you know, a lot of rules and regulations and high taxes and fascism. And the people that are really rich, you know, the, the same rules don't apply to them or they can they can hire the right tax attorneys or tax accountants so they can get around the tax laws. But the average guy doesn't have the resources to be able to do any of that stuff. So the, the middle class guy pretty much gets screwed. And I think that's why the middle class is getting screwed for a whole bunch of reasons and in inflation and um, you know a lot of the the high paying middle class jobs that used to be available are almost all gone. Well, the, the, as you say, uh, there's always good things happening in the economy. You got high tech, you got biotech, you got uh, social media, you've got um, some high value added activities going on, but it's not enough. It's not because there are so many people underemployed in the United States and there's a mismatch between what people are studying like these crazy majors you have at college that have no no um, uh, career opportunities. And so you have business majors, you have science majors. Uh, that's where the jobs are. I mean, as much as I love liberal arts, it's very hard to, to have a career when you're only a liberal arts major. You need um, marketable skills. Now, admittedly, if you're a great writer, you can, uh, you can uh, get a job in the marketplace because companies need good writers, good communicators. So there are always uh, jobs for people who have uh, high uh, skill levels and uh, not these touchy-feely majors that are out there. That's well said. Yeah, and hope maybe eventually the price of school will, will start coming down <laughs> after the government stops, uh, stops guaranteeing all the credit for, uh, for all these student loans. Absolutely. Well, uh, Murray, I really enjoyed our discussion. I want to thank you again for your time. Uh, how do our listeners uh, go watch your documentary, and uh, where can they find your articles when you put them out? Well, I have um, murraysebrin.com. I haven't been blogging for quite a while because I've been busy last year with the campaign and working on these documentaries. And if you go to YouTube, you can find my documentary, uh, The Federal Reserve, 100 Years of Boom and Bust. And we have an income tax documentary. And we're now finishing up the, uh, the third documentary, The 50th Anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid which um, uh, we've got some great uh, uh, interviews with people in the healthcare field and economists and um, uh, analysts uh, to put, uh, that we're putting together about uh, how Medicare and Medicaid have, um, have uh, worked for the past 50 years and what are the solutions to um, possibly replace these uh, programs. So um, next year, uh, I'm hoping to do another documentary on how to um, uh, abolish the welfare state. Very good. Well, uh, keep up the good work, and um, I definitely want to have you back on in the near future. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Jason. Uh, uh, it was a great, uh, great interview.